Welcome to The Two Testaments, a guided journey through scripture with leading experts on the Bible, hosted by Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or at thetwotestaments.com. Follow us on Twitter at the number two testaments or ask questions in our Facebook group. Welcome to the Two Testaments podcast, a guided journey through scripture. I'm Will Kine. And I'm Ronnie Cosman. And in this episode, we're looking at Romans 16. Today, we're talking to Dr. Beverly Gaventa. Dr. Beverly Gaventa is Distinguished Professor of New Testament at Baylor University. She's the author of a number of important works on Paul, including a commentary on First and Second Thessalonians. She's also the author of Our Mother, St. Paul, and most recently, When in Romans, An Invitation to Linger with the Gospel According to Paul. And let me just say, that is one of my favorite titles in biblical scholarship. <laughs> I remember when I first thought it, heard, first heard it, and I thought, that is genius. The win in Romans. Did you come up with that, Beverly, or is that the publisher? It was actually a title I used for a series of lectures I gave. And the truth is that somebody suggested it to me. I was with a group of people that I actually didn't know, and I was sort of brainstorming. And someone spoke up and said, when in Romans, and it, I didn't pay much attention. And then later on, the more I thought about it, the better I liked it. The problem with that is that I have not been able to go back and properly thank that individual. Okay, so maybe if that person is listening, they can contact uh, Beverly and let, let her know so that she can express her thanks for that genius <laughs> title for the book. Now, Beverly, when I was um, on the quest to find a PhD program, um, I asked Stephen Westerholm, who is my uh, thesis advisor at McMaster, I asked him, who, who would you study with? And he gave two names. I won't reveal the second one. But one of the names he said was Beverly Gaventa, okay. that if he was going to do a PhD, he would study with Beverly Gaventa. Right. And, you know, I, I have great admiration for Stephen Westerholm. Right. And so for him, when he said that, I thought, wow, Beverly Gaventa, I got to have her on the podcast. Yes. Thinking back, you, know? but you just couldn't imagine leaving Canada at that yes. point in your life. Oh, well, that's right. Well, that's I, right. Actually well, I am <laughs> actually quite moved by that uh, anecdote, Ronnie, because I have great admiration for Steve, too. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's yeah. fantastic. Now, Beverly, what first dr uh, drove you, inspired you to start studying Romans? That actually goes back all the way, I won't say quite how many years, to my uh, first year in seminary. Um, I was not actually interested in New Testament at all. I had had some pretty bad classes as an undergraduate, and uh, I was trying to um, deal with a requirement that I take some New Testament classes. And so I stumbled into an exegesis class on Romans taught by J. Lewis Martin, and that was the beginning, you know, and that was, that was the end. Um, <laughs> Part of it for me was the sheer puzzle of it, the, the uh -huh. following Paul's logic and trying to understand how one thing was connected to another. The other, I think, was this glimpse of uh, what Paul is saying to us about God's relationship to us and how uh, generous, how capacious that is. And I, I've been drawn to that ever since. Beverly, um, we'd like to talk to you about Romans 16, and especially the women that we have presented to us, because there are actually a lot more women here in, at the end of Romans than I think most uh, readers are accustomed to seeing. Um, so in Romans 16, Paul gives us a number of names that he wants greeted, and he mentions these women. He says in verse 1, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church of Centuria. Uh, he wants Priscilla, along with her husband Aquila, to be greeted and calls them both my co-workers in Christ Jesus. He wants Mary to be greeted, as well as Trif Trifina and Trifosa, women who he says worked very hard. And of course, he wants Andronicus and Junia to be greeted, who he says are outstanding among the apostles. What do you think is most difficult to understand about the list of uh, women here? 
I think what's most difficult about this list of women is uh, that we have ignored it. Hmm. And we have made decisions, uh, at least the church has often made decisions about the leadership roles of women based on other texts, but never on these texts and without taking these in, into proper account. Hmm. So what do the, the names of these women, the genders that we have here and how they're described as workers and co-workers, what do you think that tells us about the kinds of positions and the roles that uh, women did have in the early church, or at least here in, uh, in Rome? If you take the language Paul uses here for the women he refers to in this list of greetings, it is language he uses elsewhere to refer to the labor of the gospel. Yeah. So I don't know precisely what that means. I don't think we have any way of knowing exactly what that means. But I don't think we can divide it up and say, oh, the women who are laboring are laboring in the kitchen making the cookies. <laughs> and the men are laboring by preaching and teaching. You know, I don't I don't think the Greek gives us any um, any way of doing that. If we're honest about how the language is being used here. So what does it suggest about what they were doing? I think it suggests that they were, in fact, teaching and preaching, uh, spreading the gospel. Now, we could talk about some particulars. It looks as if. Uh, Prisca and Aquila have a have are hosting a church in their home, whatever the home looks like. Um, Junia is, you know, Paul identifies her as an apostle, is which is a word he doesn't use just for the twelve, but he uses for anybody who's sent with a message of the gospel. Um, Phoebe's role is apparently more complicated still. She is, a, we call her a deacon. He says she's a patron. Um, and I think there's several things we can say about Phoebe in particular. Yeah, let's zoom in on a couple of these figures because there's been some controversy about how we understand them. Yes. Uh, so let's let's look at Junia first. So Junia okay. is mentioned along with Andronicus in verse seven. Uh, Paul says, "Greet Andronicus and Junia, my relatives." Here I'm reading the NRSV, mm -hmm. who were in prison with me. Mm -hmm. They are prominent among the apostles. And they were in Christ before I was. So the first aspect of controversy in this passage is the gender of Junia. So there's you know some some debate uh, about whether Junia is actually a male or a female. Could you fill us in on where that debate now stands in biblical scholarship? Well, I need to invoke the name here of uh, first of all Bernadette Bruton and more recently Eldon Epp as having done so much groundwork on this. I, I'm sure there's not unanimity. There's never going to be unanimity on these things. But I think we're pretty close to un unanimity on Junia as the name of a woman. Um, to put it as quickly as I can, in Greek, Junia, you could either have Junia or Junius given the way the Greek reads. This could be a male named Junius or a female named Junia. Um, the problem is that we have attestation in multiple places for the use of a woman's name, Junia, in this period, and none for the use of a man's name, Junius. Right? Also, for the first 1,400 years of the church's life, Every reference to this pair assumes that she is a, that she is who she is, a woman, assumes that this is a woman. So there's a lot of other detail I could go into, but I think that the, that, that that debate has been settled, that we're looking mm -hmm. at a female. Okay. 
But then the second issue that's debated here, well, I guess there's there are kind of two related issues later in the verse, which is what the phrase that the NRSV translates, they are prominent among the apostles. Uh, so there's two issues there. Is The first is the prominent among, some have suggested other ways you could understand mm-hmm. that, and then the apostles. You've already alluded to the meaning of apostle. Could you walk us through how you see uh, this verse making sense with these, you know, the debate over those issues? Yeah, the uh, the debate, it, the suggestion has been by some that, well, this is a woman, but what they mean is that they're wide, they're highly regarded by the apostles. And, you know, this is a this is a word that can go in. This is a preposition in Greek that can go either way. However, I think Eldon showed on grammatical grounds that it's highly unlikely that Paul means Junia is highly regarded by the apostles. And in a recent wonderful article, uh, Jan Jan Lin of Yale University pointed out that Paul is elsewhere not at all interested in what other apostles think, right? Mm. In fact, he goes out of his way in Galatians to say, I don't care what they think, you know, these so-called apostles. So it seems likely to me that what Paul is saying is that these are prominent figures among the apostles. Again, as I said earlier, from Luke, we're used to thinking of there being 12 and only 12, right? And Paul himself, Luke does not regard as an apostle. Paul regards there as being a larger group. The word simply means somebody who was sent. So I think Paul is using it in a larger sense. Um, But it does mean that Paul regarded her as having this, uh, it seems to me, established role of some sort. Do we know much about what apostle, what that role meant for Paul? So it's someone who is sent, but... Would this person have necessarily been a church leader? Would they have been preaching? Do we know exactly what the role involved? I don't think we know exactly what Paul means by it, but I don't think that we can then use that lack of knowledge to say, well, for a woman, it must have been one thing and for a man, something else. That's where I think we run into a lot of trouble. So if you're going to think of an apostle in a certain way, <laughs> you need to be consistent and you have to right. apply it to men just as well as women. Right. Whatever Paul, you fill that word in with based on what we know of the early church. Right. Paul does not seem to make distinctions between the two of them. Right. Okay. Now let's take a look at another figure, uh, Phoebe. So in verses one to two, uh, Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe a deacon of the church of Centuria, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints and help her in whatever she may require from you. For she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. So Beverly, she's described as a deacon and as Paul's benefactor. What do those two things indicate about her? And why is Paul commending her to the church at Rome? Uh, Those are great questions. When I look at a new translation of Romans or a new commentary on Romans, this is the place I go first to see what's said about Phoebe, because it usually tells me a lot about the commentary. Um, Sometimes deacon has been translated as deaconess. There's no such Greek word in this period or something like helper, servant. Uh, Those are not bad terms. I mean, a deacon is you know, a a server of tables. The thing is, Paul has just, back in chapter 15, referred to Jesus uh, in chapter 15, verse 7, sorry, verse 8, Christ became a deacon, (laughs) right? So whatever he says, I'm not saying Christ, that Christ and Phoebe are the same, but again, we can't use the title and just assume that, well, because it's a woman, this deacon must have been just a kind of helper out with the children's program. 
Um, so she is some kind of, I think, leader, organizer of this community. Uh, Kinkria is a um, port church, uh, sorry, port, is the port of Corinth. So I suspect Paul knows her. He is writing from Corinth. I suspect he knows her there. Uh, he says she oh. is a prostatus, a benefactor. Um, we could even use the term patron. Uh, you know, if they were putting up plaques in the local churches, Phoebe's name would probably have been on a plaque. I think this implies <laughs> she has some resources. She is able to travel. You know, he is commending her. Uh, she it has been a support to him and to others. I, I think this means she is a person of some means. Uh, we might think of uh, the reference to Lydia over in Acts 16 as somebody who is uh, uh, a host to the work of the, of the congregation, of, to the work of Paul's ministry. He goes on to say, you know, welcome her in the Lord. So this is not, she is not at Rome. She is in Corinth. Uh, most everyone agrees that this means she is the one who's bringing the letter. And that's worth noticing because they didn't have mail service such as we know it. You had to trust someone. Mm. And that already conveys trust. Uh, I think, and there's dispute here, but I think, um, many scholars have come to believe that she is actually the one who is reading the letter. At any rate, she is Paul's representative in Rome, which means she is a kind of interpreter for him. Uh, at the very least, she is the one who is representing his work there. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more, what it might have meant for her to carry this letter and interpret it for the church in Rome from Paul? Yeah, well, you know, there have been, what, 2,000 years worth of men talking about this text, but it looks to me as if the first person who got to interpret it was a woman. <laughs> and that, to me, is uh, a lovely irony uh, or the beginning of a tragedy in the church's life, you know. Um, I, if, if she is interpreting it, if she's reading it, then she is interpreting it. Yeah, because when you read something already, you're making an interpretation of it. Um, whatever, even if she wasn't, when I say she interprets it, I mean, this is a letter that we've already seen requires discussion, right? She is the only one, she is the link, the human link between Paul's dictation of the letter and its earliest reception. So in my mind, she must be the one who helped them to understand what it was he was up to in this letter. Yeah, I mean, it makes natural sense. If she was there at the church in Corinth with him, and then she reads this letter, or even if she brings it there, the first person that people are going to ask, what is Paul doing in Romans 5 here? What is he the talking about? The chapters, <laughs> <laughs> would be her. I mean, she'd be the natural person. What, what do you think he was thinking about when right. he said this because she was there with him right. uh yeah I, I, and i don't know well this would take us off on a longer tangent probably how many of the romans actually would know paul do we know do we have any idea about that well i you know i i recently made the mistake of saying none of them and i, I was morally embarrassed by that the letter <laughs> itself these greetings suggest that he knows some of them how well he knows them is another question when he says, greet uh, Apelles um, and greet over in verse 10 or greet Tryphena and Tryphosa in verse 12, does he know them or does he know about them? Mm -hmm. you now, mm -hmm. there may be a certain amount of networking going on here precisely because he has not been in Rome and he is trying to establish uh, a set of relationships there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Well, thank you so much, Beverly, for taking us uh, through some time in Romans. So we've been in Romans for a little while with you, and we really appreciate your insight on these passages. We just have one more question for you, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, What we like to do at the end of our episodes is to ask the scholars that we have on to participate in that genre that biblical scholars seem to have perfected, which is the blurb, right? Recommending something. And it doesn't have to be a book. Uh, It could be a movie or a TV show or some kind of life hack that you picked up during the lockdowns or something that you think our listeners might appreciate. So do you have a blurb for us? My uh, blurb for the moment, uh, and I get no money from this endorsement, I want to say, <laughs> is uh, a an app that I put on my computer that is called Freedom. And when you activate Freedom, you are cut off from the internet. So you cannot do email. You cannot go to Facebook. You cannot, uh, you can't do searches, which is something of a problem. But it means that when I want to write for an hour or an hour and a half, I put freedom on and it cuts me off. At least now you can get out of it, but I have to think about it. And it sends me back to my work. Beverly, thank you so much for taking this time to walk us through Romans 16 and all of these issues here and and help us to understand and kind of bring that world to life in this chapter and what it might indicate about the roles of these important people in the early church. And we'd like to invite our listeners, uh, if you found this episode helpful, to share it with others, uh, to go on wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a rating. We always appreciate that. You can also go to our website, the two testaments.com, where you can subscribe. So thanks again for listening. Thanks to you, for Beverly, for participating. The Two Testaments is produced with the support of Stanford University, where Ronnie Cosman and Will Kynes are professors in the Department of Biblical and Religious Studies. Thanks to Cameron Thomas and Vanessa Kynes for lending us their voices, the team in the Faculty Success Center for their guidance, and our student assistants, Harrison Pike, Emmy Johnston, and Whitney Fix for their help with production, editing, and promotion.